Good evening. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Adam Lockyer. I'm from the Department of Security Studies and Criminology here at Macquarie University. Thank you for joining me tonight. I'm going to be discussing my upcoming book. It's going to be available next year in January or February. Um, so hopefully give you a taste of what's included in the book. And if you have any questions about the book, um, I'll be able to answer them in the Q&A session at the end. Uh, after I've spoken briefly about the book, I'm going to also introduce a few of the courses that are offered at the Department of Security Studies and Criminology. So tonight I'm going to cover everything in the book, um, in part because that's because we haven't got enough time, and second of all, I want people to buy the book. So I'll give you a bit of a taster, and then hopefully you'll enjoy it enough that you'll go to the local bookshop. So the book itself is going to be published in January of uh, 2017 through Melbourne University Press. It's called Australia's Defence Strategy, Evaluating Alternatives for a Contested Asia. So you can go online, the link's there, and it's got a great front cover, a silhouetted Collins class submarine. Um, so it looks fairly good, I think. So first off, let's discuss um, terms. So all academics enjoy definitions, you know this, but in this particular case, it's more than mere semantics. If you get involved with Australian defence strategy and Australian defence policy, you'll quickly find that terms get thrown around loosely. So Australian defence policy, Australian defence strategy, Australian defence doctrine, what do these terms actually mean? And if you're reading the literature, they often get thrown around interchangeably. So at one point, a scholar might be talking about defence strategy, then talking about defence policy, and they'll use the terms as though they're the same thing. Now, this is a really poor thinking, okay? Because if we're thinking about terms, we're actually using thought. So if we're using sloppy language, we're also using sloppy thought. So we want to differentiate between what defence policy is on the one hand and defence strategy is on the other. So what are the differences between these different terms? Well, defence policy is all is the translation of strategic interests into strategic objectives and the organization of military capabilities around them. So if you want to use an analogy, you could use a sporting analogy and that of a soccer team. So in a soccer team, the division of labor is separated between the management, the coach, and the defense policy stuff is what is normally done by the club's management. So at the start of the season, the club management sits down and it decides, first off, what competition it wants to be involved in. It doesn't want to invest its time in the Premier League or doesn't want to get involved in European uh, tournaments. And where does it want to invest its money? It doesn't want to invest in marquee players, doesn't want to invest in stadiums, doesn't want to invest in the grassroots of the club. Well, defence policy does something similar. At the defence policy stage, the policymakers gather around and they decide, well, what it is that they want the defence of the country to do. Do you want it to look, in terms of grand strategy, at global interests? Or do you want it to be more uh, local, uh, looking at local interests? And after you've de defined what interests you want your defence policy to mitigate, you then want to decide, well, what capabilities you want to invest in? Do you want to invest in submarines or aircraft, bases, more troops, larger army, uh, more sophisticated army? Where are you going to invest your capabilities? And that's largely the domain of defence policy. That's different from strategy. Strategy is the doing. So once again, if we want to look at our sporting analogy, it's the domain of the coach. So in a soccer coach, he's thinking about how he's going to win the game. So if you bring on a second striker, this might be um, counterproductive if you believe that the other coach is going to bring on more defenders. So strategy is about that interaction between two competing players. So it's not 
thinking about what I'm going to do. It's going to be about how you're going to react to what I'm doing. It's the application of those capabilities to achieve the objectives that are defined by the defense policy. So you can see that the two things are related, but they're very different. Strategy is about the application of the military forces. Whereas defence policy is about building them, deciding what they're going to do. It's about defence budgets, procurement, basing. It's a different creature. So separating those two things out are really important for a book like mine. Because what I'm looking at is the defence strategy side, not the defence policy side. Finally, a term that gets bantered around a fair bit is defence doctrine. So defence doctrine is the organisational culture of the military force. So once again, if we talk about our sporting analogy, a player could go overseas from Germany or Brazil and play in a different competition and then come back to the national team after many years away and slide right in because they know the culture of the place. And defence doctrine is something similar. It's about reducing the uncertainties about how your side is going to react. So in terms of doctrine, you can train up your force to do a certain job um, and they take on a certain culture associated with that job. So even within the US military, if you think between the US Marines and the US Army, if you took a Marine out of the US Marine and, and embedded them in an army unit, they would come under all sorts of co uh, cultural shock that there will be different terms, there'll be different ways of doing things, um, they'll just be a, a very different cultural creature. So what defence doctrine does is it embeds that culture and it shapes that culture in order to perform a certain task. And that's um, that the end game is always defined by defence policy. Now that's important because you often hear um, parts of Australian defence planning are used as policy, strategy, or doctrine. For example, in the 1980s, um, the dominant Australian uh, defence policy was called the Defence of Australia. Now, the Defence of Australia doctrine is often called a doctrine, it's often called a strategy, it's often called a policy. And if we're going to have some clear thinking about what it was, we need to define our terms first. So. Something like the Defence of Australian um, was a defence policy, not a strategy. Um, but there were st strategic elements, and I'll come to that later on. So a part of that definition were these other two terms that we throw around, strategic interests and strategic objectives. Now, they're two different things as well. So what are strategic interests? Well, strategic interests are those elements within a state's geopolitical outlook that are essential for reducing the likelihood of a conventional military attack. So if you look at a map of any country, the most likely avenue that an opponent is going to use to invade the country has remained um, remarkably similar um, over, over time, over centuries sometimes. So if you're the Spanish, you know that a land base attack is going to normally come from the north and it's going to come through the Pyrenees. There's only a few avenues through the Pyrenees that a likely opponent is going to take. And so they fought battle after battle after battle on the same battlefields because that's the avenue that they're going to take over the Pyrenees. Um, likewise, you have the same battlefields in Belgium and France. If you've ever been backpacking uh, through Europe and you've come to uh, a, a place where there's been a battle, you often see um, evidence of a more recent battle on the same piece of dirt. You'll go to an Australian war memorial in France or in Belgium, and you'll see bullet holes from the Second World War. So the most likely avenue of advance, uh, the most likely avenue that a, an opponent is going to take to invade your country remains fairly static over time. Now, they're your strategic interests. So let's talk about maritime countries, because Australia is a maritime country. So first, let's look at uh, Britain. Now, Britain's strategic interests have remained static, have remained 
um, enduring over, an, over a prolonged period of time. What are they? Well, first off, their primary strategic interest, the most fundamental strategic interest, is that of the British Isles and the seas that, sur that surround them. So if all else falls, falls away, what the British will hold most dear is that they hold control over the British Isles, that no other great power can get a foothold in the British Isles, and they maintain control over the English Channel and the seas that surround the British Isles. That is their most fundamental strategic interest and has remained the same over centuries. The next are the Low Countries, so Belgium and the Netherlands. Why? Well, they're the most likely ports that any attacker from the continent would use to transport an army over to the British Isles. So both the Netherlands and Belgium are small countries, uh, but England and, or Britain has uh, repeatedly come to their aid in order to maintain the independence, to make sure that no rival or hostile great power on, Europe, on the European continent would take them over. Because if they did, they would be able to ferry troops across to Britain much quicker. So, and this is important. So you think about uh, another, another maritime country, Taiwan. Now, Taiwan has been able to maintain its independence, maintain its security against mainland China since 1949. How has Taiwan, a very small, a fairly small country, compared to a massive country, been able to maintain its independence? China has a standing army of about 2 million, whereas um, the Taiwanese have a standing army of about 200,000. Much, much smaller. How can it defend itself? This is because that when you're talking about sea, the calculations change. So it's not the size of your total army. It's about how much of your army you can transport at any point in time across onto your rival's piece of territory and then move the ships back and ferry the next lot of troops across. So although the Chinese have a military of 2 million soldiers, it can only transport a very small fraction of that number, of about 15,000 at any one time across to Taiwan. So if you land 15,000 troops on, Ty on Taiwan sorry, soil, the Taiwanese have the numbers to defeat that, that, that force. And so it's about the speed that um, the Chinese or others would be able to ferry troops across to get a critical mass on the piece of land that they're trying to invade. So the piece of territory that's most, uh, well, the closest to cross the sea becomes really important to a maritime state that's trying to defend itself. Next, in terms of the priorities of Britain, is that no rival great power gets sole control over the continent. So to this end, um, the British have been on the side of the French against the Germans, on the side of the Germans against the French, on the side of the Italians against the Germans. Um, they've swapped sides to make sure that no one great power gets sole control over the continent. Finally, the favourable international environment. So this is more of a global outlook, that they want peace and stability globally. Um, because that will help their own security. But this is the most, this is the, the largest or the most distant of their strategic interests. So you can see that there's a clear hierarchy of strategic interests. And you could go back to uh, 17th century Britain and they'd be the same as they are in the 20th century. Next, let's take another maritime state, Japan. And the Japanese hierarchy of strategic interests have remained very similar as, as we work through. First is the Japanese archipelago. This is the first strategic interest. The most fundamental strategic interest is that no rival power will attack their territory and that they, can, they maintain control over the littoral sea. So the seas that are just off the Japanese coast. Next, is the Korean Peninsula. The Korean Peninsula in Japanese strategic thought holds a very similar uh, place as the Low Countries does in British strategic thought. 
It's the closest point that land power could use to ferry troops across and invade the Japanese islands. So the Japanese have either tried to maintain their own control over the Korean Peninsula or have defended the Korean Peninsula against rival great powers. The next is that no rival great power gets control over East Asian landmass. So to this end, they fought the Russians, they fought the Chinese to make sure that neither of them get sole control, uh, hegemonic control over continental East Asia. Finally, a favorable international environment. So if you look at Japanese strategic interests, they follow the same hierarchy, the same logic as Britain's. And if we look at most maritime states, they follow a similar logic. So we can use this to overlay on how Australia rates its strategic interests. First, it's the Australian mainland and the Little Seas. This is the most fundamental strategic interest of Australia, that no other country will attack Australia's mainland. And uh, an extension of that is that no other um, state will be able to threaten the Australian mainland by sailing naval power into the Little Sea, so off, off Australia's coast. Next, the Indo-Pacific Arc. The Indo-Pacific Arc is the narrow stretch of um, the maritime uh, land mass between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So namely, it's Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. And these are, this is the area that plays a very similar role to the low countries in British strategic thought or the, the Korean Peninsula in Japanese um, strategic thought. But Australia is a big place, much bigger than Japan or Britain. And so we have a second um, strategic interest as well, and that's the Melan Melanesian arc. So this is the arc of states that wrap around the east coast, the north and east coast of Australia, from East Timor, Papua New Guinea, and all the way out to Fiji. And this is an Australian strategic interest because if a great power, a hostile great power, was to gain a foothold in, say, New Caledonia, the Solomon Islands, or Papua New Guinea, then this would give them a base from which they could launch um, an attack on Australia. Finally, um, well, second last is that no hostile power gets control over Southeast Asia. And so Australia has fought to make sure that no hostile power gets control over uh, continental Southeast Asia. And finally, a favorable international environment. So that's what strategic interests look like and that's how they operate. Now, strategic objectives are different. Strategic objectives are what uh, uh, defense policy and defense strategy should aim to mitigate. Now, just because there's a hierarchy of strategic interest doesn't necessarily mean that that's the order that they should be converted into strategic objectives. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, the first is, that some strategic interests are just not threatened. And if they're not threatened, it's just a waste of capabilities. So take New Zealand. New Zealand is a maritime state. Um, and do, does it convert the New Zealand and the Little Seas to its primary strategic objective? No, because it's not under immediate threat. Does it convert the Eastern Australian seaboard to its primary strategic objective? No, because that's not threatened by a hostile power. What about that no rival great power gains control over continental Australia? No, of course, that's ridiculous. No, it's not under immediate threat. A favorable international environment, yes. So New Zealand has reconfigured, reconfigured much of its military for peacekeeping, counterinsurgency, stabilization operations. It's that last, um, strategic interest, which has been converted into its primary strategic objective, because that's the one that's threatened. None of these other ones are threatened. So directing your military power to mitigating a threat, a non-existent threat, to one of these other 
strategic interest would be uh, just a waste of capabilities, a waste of money. The other um, thing to keep in consideration is the role of your own military power. So if it's beyond your own capabilities to mitigate a threat to that particular strategic interest, then once again, it's a waste of money and you shouldn't convert it to a strategic objective. For example, although Australia might want to make sure that no rival great power gets control over the Southeast Asian landmass, to picking a fight with China or India uh, in, uh, that far away is probably beyond Australia's very small defence forces to do. So if it's beyond your capabilities to, um, to mitigate, then it doesn't make sense to convert to a strategic objective. So once again, you can look at Madagascar. Madagascar looks, on paper, on a map, looks similar to Britain, Japan, New Zealand, Australia. It's a maritime power, yet it has no real defence force. It has four patrol boats, and that's it. And so it can't convert um, the East African seaboard to a strategic objective. It can't convert the um, African continent to a strategic objective because it hasn't got the military power, the military capabilities in order to mitigate those threats. So thinking that way, let's come back to Australia's strategic interests and the hierarchy. The Australian mainland, should that be converted into Australia's primary strategic objective? Well, no, it's nobody thinks Australia is going to be attacked tomorrow. Um, and there's no credible threat to the Australian mainland. No one's going to invade Australia. No one's going to be, uh, attack the Australian mainland. Um, so there is no credible threat to Australia, at least a conventional of military attack on Australia at the moment. Therefore, it would make, make no sense to convert the Australian mainland to Australia's primary strategic objective. What about going to um, the bottom? A favourable international environment or that no rival gets sole control over Southeast Asia? Well, once again, these are probably beyond Australia's meagre capabilities. We could do what New Zealand does, turn our defence forces into a, a large peacekeeping operation, but our contribution is only going to be a token force when you're thinking about the operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. And so we need to think about well, what, what interests are, have a credible threat and what's within our capabilities to uh, help to mitigate. And that leaves the two in the middle, the Indo-Pacific arc and the Melanesian arc. And what I would argue is that these two um, strategic interests ought to be what we convert as Australians into our strategic objectives. That's the end of our defence policy and the end, the ultimate goal of our defence strategy. So, and this is nothing new. So if you look at a historical view of um, the Indo-Pacific arc, we can see that in the past we've converted the Indo-Pacific arc into our primary strategic objective. So in, during the, um, the Singapore strategy, at the start of the 20th century, it was Singapore which was the, the main goal, the defence of Singapore, which was Australia's primary strategic objective. Next, during forward defence, it was the Malaysian Peninsula. Once again, that would became our primary strategic objective. During the late 1970s and through the 1980s, it was the defence of Australian mainland. And from there, we went into the air sea gap as well. And the air sea gap was out into um, the Indo Pacific arc. So we've got a history of converting the Indo Pacific arc into our primary strategic objective, and we ought to again. The Melanesian arc. So the Melanesian arc hasn't always been converted into a strategic objective. The reason for this is that it hasn't been threatened, it's a bit of a, a placid backwater. Um, where no great powers are going to try to intervene or take over or create bases in. That is with one exception. That is, if a Melanesian state um, descends into civil war, has a, we have a failed state on our doorstep, then one of the great powers may be tempted to intervene, particularly if Australia doesn't intervene. 
Um, you might see um, the United States, you might see Japan, China, India, one of the other great powers might intervene to, re to restore order if we fail to take action. And having foreign troops this close to the Australian mainland would be a threat to our strategic interests and therefore we need to mitigate it. So since about 2000, um, in the 21st century, Australia has begun to convert the stability of the Melanesian arc into a strategic interest. And I'd argue that um, we need that to continue. So what are the threats to um, the Indo-Pacific arc? Well, historically, how we've conceptualized the threats to the Indo-Pacific arc, that is Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, is along its vertical axis. So the vertical axis um, is the one that, say, the Japanese used to um, attack Australia in 1942. So a great power, whether it's Russia, China, Japan, would use the Indo-Pacific arc as a stepping stone to attack the Australian mainland. In the 21st century, the threats to the Indo-Pacific arc are different. Uh, instead of thinking about the threats to the Indo-Pacific arc on the vertical axis, We've got to start thinking about them on the horizontal axis because in the Asian century, it's going to be, the Indo Pacific Arc is going to be some of the most important strategic real estate on the planet. The great power that has control over Indo Pacific Arc has its hands over the throats of its rivals. What do I mean by that? Well, 80% of China's energy comes through the Malacca Straits. That's a narrow strait between uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and um, some, the island of the Indonesian island of Sumatra. So if you're able to block off uh, the Indo-Pacific Arc, and there's only a few narrow straits that most of the energy needs of China and Japan come through, you, you don't need to fight them. You just block it off, and within a few weeks, they're going to be suing for peace because all their lights go out, the industry stops, the cars stop, they're out of oil, they're out of energy, and that's all you need to do. So you can have a, a, what they call a distant blockade strategy. And everybody knows this. So the Indo-Pacific arc is just as important to India as it is to China, as it is to the Japanese. And the emerging great powers, China, India uh, in particular, are expanding their spheres of naval influence towards the Indo-Pacific Arc in order to, if they can get control over the Indo-Pacific Arc, then they're going to feel far more secure because they've removed the hands off their rivals from their own neck and they can then apply pressure to their rivals. So you can see that China is expanding its sphere of naval influence down through the South China Sea, down towards the Indo-Pacific Arc, which is an Australian strategic interest. On the other side, however, something also is happening that's going unnoticed, and that is that the Indians are rapidly expanding their navy and they're present in the Bay of Bengal. So the South China Sea and the Bay of Bengal are starting to become uh, mirror images of each other. Two spheres of naval influence are emerging in Asia, and you have the Indo-Pacific arc as the buffer between the two. And the two great powers will start to tussle, will start to compete for influence through the Indo-Pacific arc, which is a direct threat to Australia's strategic interest. In this figure, you can still see the, the figures, uh, the, the positions of the rival navies. So it's unlikely that the Chinese will ever get sole control over the South China Sea. Not in the same way that the Americans have control over the Caribbean, for example. However, they will start to have much greater influence through the South China Sea. On the other side, it's unlikely that the Indian Navy will ever have hegemonic power through the Bay of Bengal, um, mostly because the US Fifth Fleet is sails through the Indian Ocean and up through the, um, the Arabian Sea. However, it will increase its influence. And the, the point of friction will increasingly be the north of Australia. 
the north of Australia through the Indo-Pacific arc. And that point of friction is something that we need to consider. How are we going to mitigate those threats? How are we going to reduce the, comp the strategic competition between the great powers through the Indo-Pacific arc? So this comes to um, what I would argue that we should do. So thinking once again about defence policy as opposed to defence strategy. Let's begin with defence policy. First, we need a set. We need to clearly define the Indo-Pacific arc and the Melanesian arc as our two primary strategic objectives. This is currently unclear. If you read the current Australian Defence White Paper, it has the Australian mainland, it has what I would call the Indo-Pacific arc and Melanesian arc, and it has the Southeast Asia and international interests as evenly balanced. And it uses, the, it uses those terms. It says that these, all these strategic interests are even in, in our eyes. We don't have one primary strategic objective. All of them are equally important. Um, this is really bad for defence planning because are we supposed to do everything everywhere all the time? And second, it fails to um, identify that the Australian mainland isn't threatened, so converting it to a, str a strategic objective is just a waste of money. And the stuff at the, the higher end, Southeast Asia and globally, is really beyond Australia's fairly small defence force to mitigate, to make, a, to, to make a meaningful contribution to. So we really need to convert the Indo-Pacific arc and the Melanesian arc into our primary strategic objectives. So how should we do this? Well, first, when Australia should pair with the other, what I call, IP4 nations. So the IP4 nations, Australia, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia. And what we want to do is make sure that the strategies that China and India have used in the Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea can't be applied through the Indo-Pacific arc. So um, the Chinese have expanded their sphere of naval influence by um, using coast guard, fishing vessels, artificial islands, um, oil rigs, all those things that are less than war. So um, the, they're not doing this in a blatant confrontational way because they know that they'll be beaten by the United States. But they're doing it in a way that uh, is expanding their sphere of influence while not putting the United States in a position where it's going to launch an attack. And it may continue. Why would it stop there? Why would it continue to push its sphere of influence through the Indo-Pacific arc and take the, um, the, the, the hand of the United States off its throat? So the IP4 nations should pair together to stop that from happening. What it means is much better surveillance. Um, surveillance through the Indo-Pacific arc is terrible. Um, we saw this with the missing Malaysian um, airliner. It wasn't even a military aircraft. It was a big jumbo jet where it flew right across the Indo-Pacific arc and no one knows where it went to. Um, so we need to keep better control, um, better surveillance of the airspace and also the seas through the Indo-Pacific arc. And that way we can keep an eye on um, Chinese, Indian, the great powers operations through this region and we can take measures to stop them um, from trying to expand their, their, their influence. If they try to go um, through more a more confrontational strategy, so trying to impose themselves through military force through the Indo-Pacific arc, then Australia should take a, a, a different approach. In this case, what would likely happen is that the other great powers would side against whoever the hostile power is, whether it's India, China, uh, whoever. Australia should take a, a peripheral approach. Um, what it means, means is that we can start to take up, take on, well, we can put our hands and start to squeeze. So we can intercept um, their oil supplies, their gas supplies, um, their merchant fleet. We can impose a distant blockade through the Indo-Pacific arc, increase the costs to the great power, and hopefully if they see that there's a credible chance Australia will undertake these operations through the Indo-Pacific arc, if they 
undertake a more aggressive approach through um, this maritime gateway, then they'll be less likely to do it in the first place and they'll be deterred. So um, Australia has the capabilities to do this type of blockade. Um, so we're not looking to increase the defence budget or buy uh, new boats and new planes. We don't need all that stuff. Uh, we can do it with our existing capabilities if we just set it as a, a strategic objective. Our final point is that we need to make sure that the Melanesian arc remains stable. It, it should, it's likely to remain a passive backwater as long as these countries don't descend into civil war and civil strife. And so the Australian military should be prepared to go into Solomon Islands, Fiji, Papua New Guinea and uh, restore order if the opportunity arises because if we don't do it, then one of the other great powers might likely do it and this would be a direct threat to one of our strategic interests. So you can see that in the book I develop a, a defence policy but also I develop a defence strategy and I spend most of my time talking about the different defence strategies in the book. So I'm willing to take some questions on the book um, in the Q&A session but before I finish I thought I'd just give you a bit of an overview of some of the teaching programs that the Department of Security Studies and Criminology offer. So we have um, an undergraduate program now in the department. Uh, we have a Bachelor of Security Studies. It's a three-year program. Uh, it's a general program, which means that you cover a whole bunch of different issues around security studies. Traditional security studies, so some of the stuff that I've spoken about tonight, um, in terms of geopolitics, uh, Australian defence policy, international security, those type of things. We also do some of the new security stuff as well. We, um, you'll cover units on terrorism, on cyber security, on the nexus between development and security and stability. Um, so we cover those type of topics. It's a three year program. It began last year. So our uh, first cohort will graduate at the end of 2017. In addition, we have master's programs. We have three coursework master's programs, a master of criminology, a master of cyber, policing, intelligence, counterterrorism, and a master of international security studies. The master of international security studies is more the stuff that I've been talking about tonight. So the traditional security, geopolitics, defense, um, international security, that kind of thing. The Master of Cyber Policing, Intelligence and Counterterrorism. It's pretty wordy, it's a bit of a mouthful. But the reason for that is that the Master's Degree is an umbrella. Underneath the Master of Cyber Policing, Intelligence, Counterterrorism are what we call specialisations. Under each specialisation are four subjects, four units. And if a student takes three of those four units, you get a specialisation. So when you get your degree on graduation day, it says Master of Cyber Police Intelligence Counterterrorism with a specialization, either in cyber security or intelligence or uh, counterterrorism or policing. So you get a specialization out of it too. So it's like doing a, a major uh, within an undergraduate program. The difference, the major difference between the uh, MAC picked and the NIS um, master programs is the Mac picked is a little bit more um, practically focused. A lot of our lecturers, some of the many of the teachers in the Mac picked will be former practitioners either in the police force, in the intelligence services, um, have operated uh, counterterrorism operations before. Whereas the Miss is more a little bit more academic, so more like my character. Um, and we'll talk more about geopolitics and um, and strategy and, and all those kind of things. The Master of Criminology will be new to next year um, and it includes some of our policing units, but uh, it's going to be on the back of a very successful major in criminology. So if some of you have studied criminolo criminology as an undergraduate and want to go on to a postgraduate degree, um, this would be a good one to do. 
our Master of Research is a pathway through to a PhD. So if you're thinking about research rather than coursework, um, then you might want to look at our Master of Research uh, degree as well. So I'm happy to answer any of your questions, either about um, the book itself um, or the teaching programs we have within the Department of Security Studies and Criminology. Thank you. Okay, so my first question is um, a student who's asking about a Master of Cyber Security and what the GPA is, and do you need to have a background in computing to complete the course? The GPA is seven, uh, four out of seven to get in, um, and no, you don't need any background in computing, computing science, computer engineering to complete the, so it isn't a Master of Cyber Security, it's a Master of Cyber Policing, Intelligence, Counterterrorism, and you do a specialisation in cyber security underneath that broad degree. You don't need any background in computing to undertake and complete the Master's degree. Uh, the major point of distinction between our program and, uh, say, a straight computing program is that it is generally a little bit less technical. So uh, we have um, undergraduate degrees in computing engineering, computing science that are very, very technical about programming and you, get, and you spend three or four years uh, doing very technical stuff. And so at the end of your cybersecurity degree, if an employer like the Commonwealth Bank or the Australian government is looking for something with technical skills, um, they'll likely go over the road and, buy, and hire a computing science person. Um, normally they're looking for um, a, a, somebody who's got a graduate degree in uh, cyber security, they're looking for a different skill set. So where are our vulnerabilities? Uh, how would we, uh, what sort of threats um, to our infrastructure should we be out for? Um, what are some of the remedies to those things? And a lot of those are more policy. So you do a bit of policy work. Um, you'll be writing. You'll be more on the side of writing security policy, of identifying risks, of uh, identifying potential remedies, of doing those type of things. And then after you've done that big picture um, cyber security analysis, then they'll wheel in the computing engineer tech guys. Uh, to actually do the programming. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a division of labor there. Um, so yeah, as, as, a, as a background, no computing science background needed. Um, and you, you'll do a little bit of computing, but um, a lot of it is more policy analysis. Okay. Um, okay, so what kind of careers do you get from your counterterrorism and intelligence specializations? Okay, so the intelligence specializations, um, often looking at intelligence organizations, um, sometimes ACES, ASIO. Um, ACES is currently recruiting graduates at the moment, I just saw on the website. Um, so, and a lot of our graduates will drift there. Um, so, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but ASIO is the um, internal intelligence organization. So they're the ones that will often look at, uh, do counterterrorism, um, uh, that type of thing, money laundry. A lot of the cybersecurity stuff is done by ASIO. Um, ACES is a sub branch of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and they're the, they're the international spies. Right, they're, they're more the James Bond guys that go overseas and get um, attached to an Australian embassy normally and, and read the news and go to cocktail parties and listen to drunken um, diplomats talking too much. Um, ASIS, ASIO, into defence, but also into corporate as well. Um, you can do um, a, lot, a lot of these, a lot of the big organisations these days. Uh, concerned about corporate espionage, about other corporations stealing their secrets. 
and um, you can get jobs in that too. So both government and non uh, and corporate as well. Counterterrorism, um, less less work for in counterterrorism in the corporate sphere. Um, however, uh, it's still uh, popular, um, and there's still jobs in counterterrorism at the state government level and the federal. Counterterrorism go and get jobs in New South Wales Police and um, or the AFP. Okay, any tips if applying for the Mac Pick Miss from a different background and have been out of study for a while? Um, no, there's no real secrets to applying. Yeah. Um, the application form goes to UAC, um, so it doesn't even come to us. It goes away to the, the university sector subcontracted out emissions years ago. Um, so it goes to UAC. Um, if you get, the, if you have the GPA, um, you have uh, a back. Uh, you have, you have a, your application seems to tick all the boxes. They'll do, normally do the emissions straight away. It sometimes comes to the department for a second opinion if something is touch and go. Um, maybe. Whatever, maybe, maybe your marks might not be so good here, but you have a lot of professional experience. You access this too hard, forwards it to the department. Um, they do that. Um, so, but once again, there's no real trick or secret to it um, to doing the um, to doing the application form. Um, if you've been out of study for a while, yeah. So we have a, a foundations course. Um, so after so this is after you've been admitted into the program, um, 850 as foundations course, and what it does is it try it knows that a lot of our students are from different backgrounds. So some of our students have been away from studying for a long time. Some of our students are straight out of undergrad with no work experience but know how to write an essay. Um, some of our a lot of our students are international students from non-English speaking backgrounds. So we have a fairly diverse group of students. And so what 850 tries to do is bring everybody up to the same level for their studies, to give everyone, get everyone from the same start. So we do a, a little bit of um, just, this is where you'd go to get information for your essays. This is how you'd write an essay. Um, a lot of students have been away from, um, from studying for a while, were even pre-computer computer age. And so the last time that they were studying, they needed to go to the library for everything. Um, whereas many of our students coming through now, um, books are often books are online, journal articles are online. Um, and if anything, the challenge has changed around from back in the day when you had to go to the library and there just wasn't enough material. There was two books in the library on the essay topic and those two books get borrowed and then what do you do? And the new challenge now is you go into Google, you type in your essay topic, and you get bombarded with 40,000 um, hits. So 850 um, helps people uh, manage that information literacy and um, gets everyone off the same starting point. Okay, the next one. Okay, um, so this question is asking that most of our units are only offered in session one and session two. Um, can you uh, complete it faster um, via distance? Um, so, um, not uh, so. Some of our units are offered in semester three. Um, but they're fairly limited. Um, most of our units are offered in semester one and semester two, but all of our units are, are offered via distant. So um, the normal, the normal, um, uh, the normal pattern of study is that in each week you'll get a lecture, um, something similar to this, uh, and that's about half an hour, forty minutes, sometimes a bit longer of lecture. 
And it doesn't matter if you're an internal student or you're an external student, you'll be expected to have watched that lecture before coming to class. The internal students then rock up on their seminar day and hopefully they're expected to have watched the lecture and done their readings before they come into the classroom. In the classroom, it becomes more of a debate discussion analysis type of seminar rather than me just lecturing at you again. Um, you should have had the lecture before you come to class. If you're an external student, what this means is um, you would have had the same lecture, the same readings, but instead of physically coming to class and having the discussion, the debate, um, the analysis, what you have is something similar online. So through online discussion forums, um, sometimes that can be an interactive tutorial. Sometimes um, it's you put up posts and people respond to your um, your threads. So it depends upon how the individual unit convener wants to run their online tutorials. Um, but hopefully the learning experience is something similar, whether or not you're an internal and external. The other good thing about it is that if you want to swap and change, you can. So um, many of our students have work and family commitments, and they can only physically get to um, campus once, maybe twice a week, but they want to do a full study load. That's fine. You do two units internally and two units externally. Um, so you can get on and uh, participate in your seminars whenever you have the time to do so rather than needing to get to campus at a fixed time. So we're fairly fixed, uh, flexible there. Okay, um, so this is a good question. It's on, uh, they see that our postgraduate coursework degrees have PACE or placement units and what sort of placement opportunities do our students commonly undertake? So we have, uh, into, we have two different ways of, of getting out of Macquarie University. The first is we have a, uh, an internship unit and we have a PACE unit. Um, we have a fairly good network of employers that we um, send our students out to. Um, some of them are, are corporate, most of them are corporate, um, particularly in cyber these days. And one of the big uh, growth areas is that um, places like the Commonwealth Bank um, ha have a, a big and booming cyber security department and they're looking for interns and pace placements. On the international security side of things, um, a lot of them go off to, um, or some of them go off to places like um, TALUS. Uh, TALUS is, used to be the Australian Defence Industries. So they're the guys that sell everything to the Australian Defence Force, from our Jeeps through to our light armoured vehicles, through to our bullets and missiles and stuff. So they, they, they used to be called Australian Defence Industries, ADI. Um, about 10 years ago now, I think it was, a French company, um, TALUS, bought them over. And they're a big multinational corporation. Um, they make everything from ships through to the high-speed trains that you catch when you're going across Europe. And then now they buy it. They make everything for the Australian Defence Force as well. Big operation, lots of money. And um, they take a fair few of our grads as well um, through either internships, PACE units, um, and then they often become a, one of our major um, employers of our graduates as well. So they're the top places we look at. Um, there's a few government places, both state government and federal government, um, mostly state government because our students, uh, for the most part, um, at least the internals, uh, live in Sydney. And um, as long as that the area is not too sensitive, is um, it's okay. So a few of the areas where our students actually get work um, are different from where they do internships and PACE because of security clearances and the like. Um, but yeah, New South Wales Police, New South Wales Government um, are two places where interns are often um, shipped off to as well. Uh, 
Okay. Um, is there a lot of data analysis in the course? Is there a social research or quantitative methods background required uh, for the Master of Cyber Police Intelligence and Counter Terrorism? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, most of our students come from um, the humanities or the social sciences. Um, very few of them have a quantitative background um, uh, in, in statistics and the like. Um, and so, yeah, we, as uh, we assume that you have no background in statistics, maths, quantitative stuff. Um, and it's really not that uh, that you uh, we will use that much in the master of cyber um, policing intelligence counterterrorism. Where you'd use quantitative methods more would be if you were to go into the master of research. So if you're going to go to the research stream, um, then you start to use those type of research methods. But for the most part. Our assessments are either um, some type of internal um, activity, sometimes like a simulation, a war game, something like that. Um, sometimes they're online quizzes. Uh, sometimes they're straight essays. Sometimes they're exams. Uh, but there, there's nothing really where you need to use statistics or quantitative analysis in many of our degrees. Okay. Is there a strong research community at Macquarie to support someone hoping to eventually undertake a PhD in the area? Um, yes, yeah. Um, so you'll come, th one of the great things about Macquarie is we have this new master of research. So if you go anywhere else or most other places and most other universities in Australia, the progression to a PhD is you do an undergraduate, you then do honours, um, you get your first class honours degree, you often do a PhD. Um, it doesn't really build up a strong community of researchers as you progress through because you get thrown in at the PhD level, you never really meet many other people, you know your supervisor, but that's about it, and then you all go off. And the PhD uh, experience is often fairly isolating. Um, you spend a lot of time alone in the library um, without knowing or having a network of people who are also doing the PhD. One of the good things about the MRES program is that it introduces, first off, a bit of research training. So rather than just being thrown in the deep end and being expected to learn the skills on your own in the library, there's some coursework units associated with the MRES, uh, which teaches you basic quantitative, qualitative skills, case studies, uh, how would you do an historical analysis, all that kind of stuff. Like how would you do a PhD? Um, I mean, I never got taught how to do a PhD, I had to figure it out on my own, whereas at Macquarie now we'll teach you how to do a PhD before we ask you to do a PhD. The other good thing is you start to you have a, a you start to build a community as, as you work through the MRES. If you're in the classroom together with the same people, um, they become your friends. And when you then enter the PhD program after the MRES, you have a year or two um, uh, background with your peers, and so you'll end up going for lunch with the, your your PhD colleagues, um, and there will be a, a stronger research community. Um, than you find at many, many other places. So that's been one of the um, unexpected side effects and one of the great advantages of doing the MRES um, rather than just doing the honours and then just throw you into the PhD. Okay. Um, I'm in Brisbane and I'm thinking about studying remotely. Before commencing studies, I'm looking to receive guidance from a potential employer. Do you have contacts in Queensland with employers that I could speak with before undertaking studies in cybersecurity? Um, I don't, but I'm sure people in the department do. Um, and if you want to send me an email um, tomorrow, um, I'll forward you on to 
um, some of our people who deal a lot with um, cyber security in the first place and those that are involved with our internships and PACE units that have a, a strong um, um, network of future employers and hopefully we can, um, we can, we can find you somebody you can contact. Okay, um, now thank you for uh, tuning in and there's now a survey here. Um, if you could just quickly fill in the survey, um, the people here in our media team would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for your time tonight.